Good morning. I love the sound of that bell. Those bells just help bring you back into your, your center again. So it's really good to see you. Good to see all of you today. So I saw an image of something this week that just, I thought, I've got to show this to the congregation. It's just, it's really something. I can't believe it. So I thought I would show you something right now. Can, you, can we show the slide? This is, this is really something. Can we do it? Well, we're working on it. There, no, no, there. Something. So I just wanted to say welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation where even bad dad humor is welcome, even lame humor like that. So we're here to have a good time and, and we're also here to uh, think deeply about matters of great importance. And this is a, an annual tradition where I, uh, instead of having a prepared sermon, I uh, speak from the heart and you have questions and Hopefully you've had a chance to, to write a question down that I might answer during the service. I probably won't have time if uh, everyone asks a question to get to all of them, but we'll, we'll get through as many as we can. And it's really important to get this because uh, even if I don't answer your question, it really helps me understand what I need to be speaking about in the coming years. So it's really helpful to me. I really appreciate your participating in this process. I look forward to getting your questions. We'll be uh, probably collecting the questions uh, a little bit later in the service, uh, right after we have a, a, a ritual in our service, and you'll find out when that is. But we'll, we'll come around and collect the, uh, the questions and bring them on up. So it's great to see you all. Thanks for putting up with something. <laughs> great. Today our gathering hymn is number 323 in the gray hymnal, uh, Break Not the Circle. It's in the gray hymnal, and please rise and body your spirit. Good morning. Each of us brings our own story to this gathering. We share our dreams and our insights and our hopes. We glean wisdom and strength from the experiences of others. Together, we make new memories and create new stories for sharing with those we love and those we have yet to meet. Please join me in saying our affirmation. Love is our doctrine. Compassion is our way. Here we seek to create a joyful home for free religious exploration, build a community of caring fellowship, nurture the hopes, and serve the needs of our world. It is our tradition at UUCS to light three chalices as we begin our Sunday service. The first is for this congregation, all its members and friends and those in our hearts. The second is for our partner church in Shimonvalva, Transylvania, Romania. And the third 
is for the children and youth who will learn from the stories we share. The flames of our chalices are beacons which welcome all those who question and seek answers. As Unitarians Universalists, we know that sometimes to question is the answer. Come and sit by our fire and share this time together. Let's join together in singing the flame into life. Good morning. Can everybody young or young at heart please join me up front? Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Hi there. Hello. <laughs> Today, we are reading a book called Intersection Allies, and it goes with the theme of Pride Month. So yesterday, the RE team went and had a booth at uh, Salem Pride and met a lot of fun friends and families, and we're hoping that we'll see some of those faces, so thank you. Okay, and the, the pictures are up there for you. Witness the lives of a bold group of friends. If one is in need, another defends. Age is one trait that each of them share, but kids' lives are unique, as, soon, as you'll soon be aware. Each child has a story and their own point of view filled with passion and power, just like you. My name is Alejandra, but I go by Ali. I use a chair, but it doesn't define me. Thank you. Instead, it allows me to zip, glide, and play. When I need to get through, friends help make a way. Where there's room for some, we make room for all. Friends can be allies, no matter how small. Hello, I'm Parker. After school every day, Allie's family takes care of us both while we play. My mom works hard to provide for me. Her love's the source of our stability. Not toys or money, nor treasures untold. Community care is more precious than gold. Skirts and frills are cute, I suppose, but my superhero cape is more cape than those bows. Some may be confused that a kid like me can wear what I want and be proud and carefree. My friends defend my choices and place. A bathroom, like all rooms, should be a safe space. My name is Adila, and just like Kate, what I wear inspires endless debate. Some give, some chant, some sing, some pray. My hijab is my choice. You can choose your own way. The clothes that you wear never justify hatred. Clothes can be playful, simple, or sacred. Covered, adorned, or with casual flair, my body's my own, I dress it with care. My name is Naya, and with what's on the news, it's easy to be frightened or sing the blues. For her, for them, for him, and for me, we all deserve to breathe and be free. The color of our skin is no reason to hide. We protest for safety, equality, and pride. Our friends join along in solidarity and love. This is the stuff that allies are made of. Safety also includes our trees and air, the land we've called home, our places of prayer. I am Dakota, and like my ancestors, 
my tribe and I are water protectors. From profit and power, we stand up to preserve our nations, our cultures, and the respect we deserve. My name is Gloria Itango Sieta Anos. After school, it's to La Fruteria I go. Trabajo cada dia junta a mi madre. Vendemos pina dolce y mangos con chile. <laughs> I, f I took French in high school, sorry. <laughs> My language and savvy allow us to thrive. I've got hopes and dreams and skills and drive. Working together makes us both more secure. I'm a daughter, a partner, and an entrepreneur. My name is Hee Jung, and I was born in Seoul. I moved here when I was five years old. I'm part of what's called the 1.5 generation. My parents and I span two different nations. Like Gloria, I am a help to my mother by translating for her one word to another. When the landlord tells mom, you can pay me next Friday, I repeat in Korean, Oma Renta Dong Ju Gamor Nado Donde. Thank you. We navigate life in our new home together because kids have the skills to make every day better. My name is Yuri, and I'm new to this place. He Jung's family welcomed me with love and with grace. Finding refuge meant traveling far from home. I sailed, I flew, I rode, I roamed. Escaping violence, war, heartache, and intrusion, we came to this nation seeking dreams and inclusion. From near, from far, from here, from there. We're more than our origins. We all deserve care. Race, religion, citizenship, class, and ability, each of these intersects to form identity. Age, gender, size, and skin color too can make living life different for a friend than for you. Barriers and biases are often to blame. We strive to be equal, but not all the same. Life's up and down, ups and downs can take me many forms, but standing together will rewrite the norms. Where there's room for some, we make room for all. Friends can be allies, no matter how small. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, next. Sunday, we are having donuts for dads, a special celebration for Father's Day in the fellowship hall after church. So we welcome you to have some sugary treats and have some fun. Um, okay, if everybody can stand up in the center to make the love arch, we will be on our way. Thank you. <laughs> a moment now to take a deep breath and just feel life in this very moment of time. Tune your heart and your mind to the deeper rhythms of our lives, the deeper rhythms and the higher callings. Here we come to meet one another and be inspired by one another. And yesterday we said goodbye to a dear friend, Sandy, Cindy Francis. And Cindy would go to the homeless camps with her husband, Bob, in the mornings. And they would take coffee and socks and hand warmers and toiletries. 
And Cindy would shout out, we've got coffee, we've got socks, as she walked among these people offering them room service, and they had no rooms. Hearing this story of Bob and Cindy's ministry has really stretched my heart, made me more aware of the callings of compassion in our world. May we search and explore new ways that we can find to walk the path of compassion in this world. For compassion is our way. And gratitude. My heart fills with gratitude for the example of those like Cindy and others who have passed recently in this congregation who hear a higher call to serve the common good, who show to us the depth of their love for us, and they inspire us. And I'm so grateful for their example. May we walk the path of gratitude daily, moment by moment, grateful for all the blessings that flow our way, compassion, and gratitude. This is our path. May it be so. Amen. Good morning. I'm Jackie Klimowitz, a member of Lifeline's Lay Ministry, and we are a committee that helps and assists Rick with pastoral care. And you can talk to us we're the ones with the lavender badge um, at the coffee hour. You can go online and there's instructions to leave a joy or concern. Or we have a book in the foyer and you can write it down and one of us will read them. And today we only have one joy. It's from Mandy Bray. If you remember Mandy, she lives in Eureka. And I called her and told her I was going to read this. And she told me that gas in Eureka is $6.89. It's 20 cents cheaper at Costco. But we're grateful we're here in Oregon. And also I asked about her mother. She called her yesterday. Mary Bray is living in Georgia uh, to be near the son, her son and daughter-in-law. And um, she got to see E.T. yesterday. Mandy helps with, um, with making sure she gets the right TV shows on. And this is what she wrote. And this is in Eureka, California. In the midst of a drought, we're getting much needed rain. Doubling the joy, PBS played Prince's Purple Rain Tour on TV last night. And I got out my flute for the first time in months and played along to Purple Rain while it was raining outside. Peak experience, not quite as good as Prince's, Prince's Super Bowl halftime show when he played Purple Rain in the rain. And you have to know um, Mandy. <laughs> she was quite a character, and we love you, Mandy. She's going to be watching this, and uh, we miss you and Mary too, thank you. And that's our only joy or concern. But lots of you probably have things in your heart that you didn't wanna to share today. But afterwards, we're going to have compassionate connections. And that's where you come to the front and we'll go to Rick's office and you can open our, your heart to us. And we're going to light one last candle for all the joys and concerns that are in our hearts today. Thank you. Number 1011 in the Teal Hymnal. That's this one over here if you haven't seen it. And again, it's page number 1011. 
First of all, I'd like to ask all the homilists and storytellers to please come and stand up here who are present today. So I see you, and there's Greg Gregg, and there's Mackenzie Kluge, and there's Gloria Holland, there's Bonnie Tarwater, Marcia Christensen, Sarah Pickett. We have a few, Bar uh, Bob and uh, Barbara, uh, Barbara Stebbins Bowes and, and Bob Muir are also part of this. They're not present today, but we have a special ceremony that we want to share right now. In the fall of this past year, we announced the formation of a new shared ministry at this congregation, homilists and storytellers, who will share with me, the settled minister, the responsibility, the honor, the privilege of speaking from this Unitarian Universalist pulpit during our worship services. And this new ministry is a validation of our theological understanding of ministry in which we affirm that lay and clergy are full and equal partners. Those who stand before you now, and the people that I told you about Barb and uh, Barbara, they completed a four-week orientation in our School of Embodied Homiletics and they are committed to process of on, processes of ongoing learning and growth in this role. And each of them has made a two-year commitment to this ministry. And we invite all of you who sense a call to a ministry of the spoken word to consider joining us when we have another training in the fall of 23. Our homilists and our storytellers are entrusted with a ministry of the spoken word. And so now let us bless and affirm our homilists and our storytellers. May the words you speak serve to connect us to the ongoing story of our free faith tradition and to the sources of truth and love and goodness. May the words you speak serve to heal and not to harm May the words you speak here serve to bring new hope and new understanding and commitment to the common good. May the words you offer in worship bring joy, and may they lead us all to walk the paths of courage and compassion with hearts full of gratitude. Do you willingly make a commitment to this shared ministry of the spoken word? Yes, you we do. do. Yeah. Good, excellent. <laughs> And to you, the members and friends of this community, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Salem, your presence and support, imagine you wrote a sermon, it's your first time up, you want some support. Your presence and your support are essential for the success of this new ministry. And so will you listen to these, your fellow members, with an open heart and mind, and will you strive to be present on Sundays to receive their spoken offerings? Yes. All right, we've got you on recording saying that. <laughs> we designed, uh, the, the group designed a special logo for this, and we're gonna, uh, let's show one of the stalls here that we have. 
Thank you, Leslie Zygon. Thank you, Greg Gregg and Mackenzie Klusch for helping us design this wonderful uh, ministry of the spoken word symbol that you'll see on the, on the uh, stoles that we'll be placing around the necks of these wonderful homilists and storytellers. So we're really uh, more or less ordaining them into our ministry. I want to make a special note about uh, Reverend Bonnie Tarwater, who is also a part of our group. Bonnie is ordained and uh, fully ordained, but we're going to give you another stole anyway. And so we want to uh, place these stoles upon these homilists and storytellers. And we also have a book. It's a narrative history of, the Unitarian, Univer of Unitarian Universalism by David Bumbaugh, a wonderful professor from uh, one of our uh, Meadville Lombard. And we have the books to present to you. So we just want you to know we love you. We thank you for taking on this ministry. And now I'm going to place the stoles, and then we can welcome them with a, a warm applause once I've placed the stoles. So let's begin with you, Gloria. Okay. And for Sarah Pickett. They will wear these stoles when they speak as a symbol of the blessing we have given them today and in recognition of the high office that they are serving when they do speak from this pulpit. Janet, Stephen, Mackenzie Kluch. Greg Gregg, and the already Reverend Bonnie Tarwater, uh, and Marsha Christensen. And now I present you with a narrative history of Unitarian Universalism so that you can help keep the story of our tradition alive. And we're so grateful. For you who have taken Thank this you. amazing step in your lives and being willing to offer yourselves and offer messages to help build our community. So would you welcome our new homilists and storytellers? They have something to say and they'll say it later. So yeah. after the service today. Thank you. There's a beautiful stall. And, and Leslie Zygon, where are you? We, we, we need especially to thank Leslie Zygon. She has worked so hard to help make these stalls a reality. So this is a, a new ministry in our congregation. And so it's really an exciting day to, to begin this. So thank you for being part of this ceremony. Thank you, homilists and storytellers. If you will pass your questions to the center aisle, they will be picked up now. While we're receiving the questions, I'll say just a little bit more about the new ministry of the homilists and the storytellers. I'm uh, responsible for 30 Sunday services a year here, and that leaves 22 when there are other things to happen. And oftentimes we'll invite guest speakers, but I think it's a, a stronger thing to invite members from our own community to speak as we build and deepen our relationships. And also so that we model to the world that the division between lay and clergy is not quite as stark as it sometimes seems to be. Uh, it's, it's really a privilege to stand and speak from this pulpit, but it, I don't think, should only be the minute privilege of the ordained minister to offer sermons. So... That's why we're changing things up a little here. Janet has at least one question to give me to get started, and then she'll be sorting them out. We're going to take about, uh, let's take 20, 25 minutes at tops, and it'll fly for me anyway, and then we'll see where we are. So, is it possible to have practice a non-deistic, non-religious moral code? Compare and contrast. Well, we always start off with an easy question because we, we want to make sure that I have a chance to get my wits about me. It's a, uh, 
a non-theistic, you know, the, the Buddhist tradition is a really interesting tradition because if you say, is there a God to the Buddhists or something, and they'll, they'll say, why don't you meditate and, and figure out things for yourself instead of worrying about speculation of some supernatural being that, that everybody can argue about forever. Uh, so it is definitely possible. And in fact, many Unitarian Universalists would call themselves agnostics or atheists. There are many amongst us who would call ourselves theists, panentheists, that's what I call myself, panentheists. But there's a, uh, a real possibility for people to have a good practice, a good life, and it doesn't need to have reference to a deity. And I think that you're, uh, some, of the, some of the finest people I know would say, I'm an atheist. So uh, I don't think that that determines who is a good person or not. Please describe how a relative mentor in a different culture have influenced your life. I had this incredible experience when I was uh, just 20 years old and I was in, uh, living in Atlanta, Georgia. I was actually going through a pretty rough period in my life, but I became roommates with a, a fellow, Keith Liu, who was uh, from Calcutta, India, but he was Chinese. He was Chinese, but he was from India. And he introduced me to his culture, his food, and not only that, but Indian culture and food too. And he introduced me to, to Buddhism. And, uh, and I introduced him to Beethoven. And we had a great time. He was a really a really dear friend, but uh, I met him at just such a critical time in my life when uh, I was just this uh, kid from Columbus, Georgia, and all of a sudden in Atlanta, and it was, uh, it was really an amazing thing to meet somebody like him who could tell me and talk to me about uh, all the different things in the world that he knew about. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. What is the source of our affirmation? The affirmation is a compilation of our, um, it, it came when we had workshops many years ago and we said, what is our vision and what is our mission? And so uh, I, I used that and I crafted it and we created uh, something that our affirmation that we say at the beginning of the service. But those were words that were originally crafted in, in workshops here. It comes from the members of this congregation. And I, uh, I think they're pretty cool. I like them better than what I would have come up with. So, lots of people ask, "What's the meaning of life?" Instead, I ask, "What's the meaning of death?" Well, I think that death certainly helps you put things in perspective. I uh, was just sitting here yesterday doing a memorial service. For, for Cindy Francis, and she died of pancreatic cancer, and it went really quickly, and it just totally devastated poor Bob and, and, and those of us around her who, who loved him, who loved her. And so being aware of death uh, really makes me appreciate life so much more, and it makes me aware that every day that I have is an opportunity to, to show more love and compassion and do good things in the world. And so I think that it's good. In fact, uh, a lot of religious traditions, memento mori, remember death. In the Buddhist traditions, they meditate next to the charnel grounds where they burn the corpses so that people can be aware of the transitory nature of our lives because that helps us to go deeper. It helps us to go deeper. And I, by the way, uh, I want to do a sermon next year uh, on, on what happens after death or not. Uh, and I'm going to draw from the Upanishads a lot from that. Uh, from that that's my personal uh, inclination to do that. What is the most pressing spiritual issue we face in the immediate future from your perspective? This is a uh, easy question and a hard answer. It's a We've become so polarized as a nation, and we're tending to see one another through that dualistic prism 
Uh, are you from a blue state or a red state? Are you for gun control or against gun control? Are you, are you, you know, for this or that? And these are important issues, and we shouldn't, you know, say, well, they're not important. On the other hand, uh, the way we're handling them and the way we're demonizing one another uh, and the way the level of vitriol and venom is increasing in our country, it's, it's struck me that what we're really called to do is help find our common center. Even if we're not finding our common political center, we need to find our common spiritual center and say, even if I disagree with you, I still respect you as a human being. We need to reclaim that. Uh, because I was just watching the movie Gandhi the other night at the end, and I saw how uh, when the partition happened between India and Pakistan, all the violence and the Hindus and the Muslims attacking one another, and, and it's, it's just terrible to see how much can happen when things go too far down a wrong path. So I'm, I'm really concerned about the state of fear of, in our country. It, it really bears uh, attention and calls for us to bring our best selves forward again and again and again. My granddaughter is trans. All the anti-trans laws being passed and the right-wing bias and tolerance makes me concerned for her safety. It feels like pre-war Germany for Jews. How can we fight the hate and protect our loved ones? Well, we don't know uh, what the future is, is bringing. It's, it's a scary time. It really is for our country. Things are kind of wobbling right now. And I, and I think that we are going to be here to advocate for the values that are so important that affirm people in all their diversity. And we have created a place here where trans people come and we love it. It's, it's a part of us. We are so glad to affirm trans people in our community. It's a wonderful thing. And so we can just help, and we are uh, starting a new, uh, our whole lives, it's a human sexuality curriculum to offer people, young people the support and the encouragement they need to be who they are and to feel good about themselves. So uh, I would say that one of the best things you can do to help is to help create a community here in Salem that stands for the values that we, uh, we believe in. And so strengthening this congregation and other liberal congregations that, that welcome and affirm trans, gay, lesbian, bisexual people, that, that uh, it's an important thing to do. Because without uh, congregations and communities that are willing to resist things, uh, it's much easier for other forces to take over. Your thoughts on karma and reincarnation? Well, I, uh, karma is an interesting one. I, I really do believe that we, uh, in some ways, uh, reap what we sow. Uh, I know that sometimes if I'm in a difficult situation and I look at it really clearly, I realize I made this, I made this happen in some ways myself. But I'm, I'm a little nervous around the idea of karma because it can be used to explain away injustices and inequities. And it's a, uh, I think it's an idea that should be used as a tool but not used in a really blanket way. Because if you say uh, karma rules, anytime a bad thing happens to a person, you can say, well, that's your karma. And as far as reincarnation, I think it's an intriguing concept, and I, I guess you, I would call myself a reincarnation agnostic. Uh, it's a, uh, it's, uh, I'll let you know in my next life, my answer. Uh, I do, I do, uh, I do sort of hope for another chance, because I, I, I think I can do things better the next time. I'm going to learn foreign languages when I'm young, and I'm going to learn to play the violin, and, and that's, I'm going to be a better person the next time. Give me another chance, please. I need it. So, the, uh, why do you like otters? I, I love them, they're so fascinating, and they also work together and they help each other. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, 
I've let it be known many times that I identify with the otter, the river otter. And the reason I do is because they're so playful. They just look like they, they're so playful. And, uh, and I enjoyed that about them. Plus, I love them to watch them swim and everything. So I, I chose the river otter as a, as a symbol just to, to remember to enjoy life and to be playful. And then somebody brought me an article about how a bunch of river otters attacked somebody and bit them. Uh, <laughs> So, so nobody's perfect, nobody's perfect, but I still like the river otters. Let's see. Uh, how may we arrive at the place where um, a much larger part of the population shares our gratitude for this miracle of life on earth? Well, how can we make people feel grateful. You, you know, uh, I remember a story of a minister and his son uh, had called him out and he was showing him a star and, and the dad wasn't paying enough attention, you know, and stuff. And, then, and, the, and the little kid said, you be glad at that star. You be glad at that star. So he was commanding him to be grateful. And it worked uh, for the little kid. Uh, but in terms of... Uh, I, uh, I believe in, in, in practice, and so uh, that means you repeat something. And that's why uh, we have compassion and gratitude reflection every week, just to remind us. And the one for com gratitude, uh, I focus more on compassion, but the one on gratitude really helps me think more about, yeah, it's, when, you, when you see things in terms of gratitude, life is much better. And so I think that us being a, a practicing community of grateful people and learning to walk the path of gratitude uh, inspires other people. And that's the best we can do. We, we can never control what other people think or feel, but we can uh, invite them into spaces where they make wise decisions. Diversity includes, includes the lived experiences uh, how can uh, UUCS, this, this is kind of, I'm sorry to, the, the writing's a little, uh, there's a lot on this here. Uh, diversity includes the lived experience. How can UUCS increase the diversity of lived experiences that members represent? If, vis if visitors feel welcome because they find members whom they relate, uh, we would truly be a welcoming congregation. Uh, is it enough to be a welcoming congregation? Visitors must truly feel at home. This is a great question. I think this is one that we don't want to just let slide by. I think that a congregation should always be asking itself, how is our welcome looking? And not only in terms of, we do a great welcome. I get lots of feedback from people that say, when I came here, I was welcomed so much and I, and I felt like I really belonged. But there is a lot to be said for increasing our awareness of uh, intercultural awareness and how we can create spaces that uh, make it possible for a diversity of people to come. It's, it's a real challenge, I have to tell you, to force this kind of thing. I think it happens organically. I think with a good heart and good intentions uh, and perseverance and perseverance will help us out. Refute the allegation that the literature of the Middle Ages is moribund. That's easy. Uh, the literature of the Middle Ages uh, provides a foundation upon which all literature has grown, and therefore uh, it's not moribund, it's just underground. So that's a question that came from a, a comedian. Refute the allegation that the literature of the uh, Middle Ages is moribund. So, <clears throat> why is Beethoven's Seventh Symphony so soothing? Beethoven's Seventh Symphony is one of my favorites. There's the opening movement to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. And Beethoven wrote uh, about uh, this movement, and he, he wrote a little passage. He says, when I am in the woods, when I, 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 I'm at one with thee, or, or something to that effect. 
And so the music, the opening movement, just sweeps you along in this, in this sense of the, the great unfolding of life. And it's, I always tell people, you should listen to the Seventh Symphony near the beginning of spring. It's just the unfolding of life. Oh, gosh. And that second movement is just such a, a heartfelt, uh, it, there's a mournful tone in that one, in that movement. And then the next two movements are pure uh, dithyrambic jubilation, as one music critic put it. A lot of dancing, a lot of fun. It's a great, it's a great symphony, so I recommend it. Which button do I push to mute the pulpit? <laughs> it's easy. If, you, if, you're, uh, we, if, if we can't control others, we can at least control ourselves. And so, does your theology have a place for some type of power of darkness and evil? This is an interesting question because it really, I think, gives us an opportunity to compare and contrast some of the world religions about uh, who, how they think about this. And in the East, and in the uh, Judeo-Christian, Abrahamic, Islamic traditions, I think we, we tend to think of evil as having a, an almost, a, what they would say, ontological status, that there is a devil, that there is, there is a force out there that's trying to lead us astray, and it's evil, and, and we have to watch out for it. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that uh, we are capable of doing really bad things. Uh, and a lot of it is done when we think we're doing good things. Uh, human history is, is littered with examples of people out on crusades, and there's a lot of bloodshed in the wake of that. In the Eastern religious traditions, uh, which I tend to gravitate to more, uh, evil, I think, is more associated with ignorance, ignorance. You're, you're doing evil things because you're not aware of the interconnected, interconnectivity of all things. And therefore, you will do things that destroy others because of your ignorance. And so, uh, in, in the Eastern traditions, I think the, the path away from evil is, is awareness. And so, I think that uh, we do ourselves a disservice when we pretend that we're not capable of doing really, really bad things to one another, and that each of us has to look within ourselves oftentimes to recognize that part of ourselves that wants to hurt and harm uh, or do selfish things. Uh, it's in everybody. And I think it's good for us to not uh, brush too quickly past that, but be aware of that part of our nature. How do you take care of your family if you're having a bad day? Uh, not too well. It's, I do okay. You know, it's been uh, really two most important things to me in my uh, life are, are my family and my ministry. And so both of them are, demand a good bit of time. And so it's, it's, it's been a struggle at times to, to figure out how to uh, meet the needs of the congregation and meet the needs of the family. But when I have a bad day, uh, I think we're old enough and mature enough to recognize that, you know, I'm having a bad day. I'll get over it. It's going to be another, a better day tomorrow. And, and to stay grounded in love, to always remind one another that, okay, we're having a bad day, but we do love each other. And I think that's really important. How do you deal with stress in your life? Well, I don't have any, so there's just <laughs> nothing to deal with. Uh, well, of course, you know, I've, at least many of you know that I, I mentioned that the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I, I meditate for two 30-minute periods, and, and I need to do that. When I, what I've discovered is uh, it's almost like my stress is like a planet. Think of your stress like this planet, and it's got all this gravitational pull on you, and it's really not good. It, it, too much gravitational pull, but I find that when I meditate, it's sort of like that planet is still existing, and it seems like it's getting smaller. It's not getting smaller, but I'm getting some distance. I'm getting some distance, and I don't get so trapped by the gravitational pull of that stress. 
And, and, and so it's a great thing to practice. It's a great thing to practice just being with the breath and just focusing the mind on the breath. And you do discover that you can make that planet smaller and has less gravitational pull and, and causes you to suffer less. Here's, do you support the eighth principle and why? That's a question that's going to uh, require a little background here. Our Unitarian Universalist hymnal, if you see it in the front, has a, uh, a, a listing of seven principles. We covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth uh, that begins with that when it goes through seven principles. There's a movement in our uh, association, and, and actually I'm not sure that it's going to continue because I think they're rethinking how they're going to do it. But the idea was to add an eighth principle that calls for us to be accountable to, for our uh, anti-racism work, which is important to do. And it's important that we have ways of uh, checking in with each other. The eighth principle is, is one that I think has uh, an unfortunate consequence in that it subverts the theology of Unitarian Universalism. And it, and it gives power to uh, a central authority. And I think that that is based in a mistrust of congregations. And so I think that there are more effective ways that we can be invited into doing this work than by adding, adding an eighth principle. I, uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, already the eighth principle is in some senses uh, embodied already in the seven principles. So it, it's, it's, it's a, in my opinion, an un unnecessary add-on. The Unitarian Universalist Association has been putting in a great deal of pressure to have people affirm this. They'll have uh, workshops and congregations about this and uh, they will not allow anybody to ask serious questions about it. And I'm disturbed by that, frankly. I've, I've talked to people in those congregations, and so are they. So it's, it's too much UUA politics to get into. We would get lost in the maze. But suffice it to say that uh, the work of anti-racism, diversity, is, and justice is so important. And there are good ways to do it, and there are ways that are sound good, maybe, but they're counter-effective, and, and they don't work. Do you believe in God, prayer, life after death? Easy questions. Uh, I call myself a, a panentheist, and I, uh, I, I mostly am grounded in the Buddhist tradition, which doesn't spend a lot of time, any time, thinking about a supreme being. But I think that even, uh, at least among some Buddhists, there's an implicit understanding that there's a sacred order to things. And I... Uh, I believe that there is. I believe that there is, sometimes I just refer to the sacred mystery because uh, when I say God, that word is really loaded and has been abused and misused in so many ways. But eh, I, I believe there is a, a deep, a deep uh, sacred order to our lives and that there is a way of seeing things and recognizing things that's very liberating when you see how things really are. It's, uh, we're getting close to the time? Yeah, we're getting close to Okay, oh gosh, I told you, time would go fast. Uh, I, so I would say, believe in God is, 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 is a term, that's sort of like assent to something. I, uh, in, in the Hindu tradition, they have a word, shraddha, I rest my heart upon. And so I rest my heart upon things being a certain way. It's not so much a belief system. Uh, I certainly do believe in prayer. Uh, prayer for me is mostly uh, silent. I meditate in the morning. I consider that a form of prayer, just being quiet, just being still, and just opening yourself. I'm not uh, somebody who practices what, what we call the petitionary prayer, where we ask for particular favors of God and, and that sort of thing. It's, it's more like I want to open myself to something greater than myself. And so my meditation practice and my bowing practice, uh, and I have, a, I have a prayer practice, I, I do, that I just stop and I just think about it and I just try to imagine the immensities of this universe and the sacred order of it and the depths of my own being and what a miracle and a mystery it is. And I enter into those reflections prayerfully. 
As for life after death, I, I think that we frame this in, in, a, in the wrong way in the West. We often think, well, I live after death. Uh, I like the way the, uh, there's a Sufi, I think it's Rumi, who said, you are not a drop in the ocean, uh, uh, you are the ocean in a drop. And I think that, that we are actually more than we think we are. And so when, and I do think we die, our bodies die, I've, I've seen it many times. But I think that there's something greater. I say it at the beginning of every memorial service. There is something more wondrous than meets the eye uh, in, this, in this life that we have. And so I, I'm, uh, I don't think that death is just the end, but I also don't think that Western conceptions of that are uh, uh, necessarily the ones that I embrace. Let's see. We're, uh, maybe I'll take one uh, Question. Let's see. I, uh, more religions require congregation members to recruit uh, or uh, only consider uh, members uh, only consider uh, members non-heathen. Hold on. Let's see. Many religions require congregations member to recruit. Or if you don't join, you're, you're not one of us. And so how does Unitarian Universalism approach this? I did a sermon once. I, I called it um, something about, I, I was watching a street corner evangelist. And at first, I was looking at them somewhat disdainfully and, you know, out there in their suit trying to, you know, get people to read the Bible. But then I, I realized this guy was really trying to do something that he believed in. And I think that it's incumbent upon us. One of the things that, that's different about Unitarian Universalism is it's not a religion to which you can convert. It is a, a path. It's a process. And so when you invite somebody to join us, you're asking them not to, to change belief systems or uh, change who they are, but to join a community. And that that will... Uh, so oftentimes, people will say, I came because my neighbor told me about it. And I think it's important to realize how many people are really, really suffering in loneliness and despair and are not connected to any kind of community. And I think it's really important to help us, for us to find people and, and bring them in because this community will enrich their lives. It really will. And they will enrich our lives. It's important. But we're not out about... Uh, changing people, recruiting them, or converting them. That's not who we are. Well, I have a few more questions that I didn't get to. I got to a lot of them, and I sure appreciate your putting up with that. I'd like to invite you to just do my favorite practice and just meditate with me for just one second here. As you think about your life and the way it unfolds, Simply remember to pause, to find a time to pause and look deeply and appreciatively. Think of others in your life and let your love awaken. Think of how you can make your life meaningful for yourself and for those around you. Always be exploring. Always be questioning and wondering. Always know that however far you've gone on the path, there is further to go. And when you get stuck at a dead end, simply turn around and rejoin the common path that leads to love and joy. May it be so. Amen. Well, we've shared our questions and received answers. Now it's time to share our resources. If you're concerned about the future of this church, share its message. 
If its values resonate deep within you, give it a measure of your devotion. If you're proud of this church, become its advocate. This month, we share our generosity with the Thompson Patch Scholarship Fund, which opens doors to students who may not have had the best grades, but are working to turn around their academic performance and community involvement. As always, we accept donations to the Marion Polk Food Share in the wagon at the front of the sanctuary. Donations may be made during the passing of the baskets or by logging on to uusalem.org and following the prompts. The morning's offering will now be gratefully received. Next Sunday, it's, uh, we're going to be uh, acknowledging Juneteenth, and it's Father's Day too, but I want to talk about a, a really wonderful uh, minister, 19th century Unitarian minister, Samuel Joseph May, uh, very overlooked, a wonderful fellow. I hope you'll join me for that, that sermon. It'll be my last uh, sermon for this congregational year. I'll be back in the pulpit in uh, September, but I'd love to see you here. News of the community, you can see that we all have a uh, a lot of stuff going on. If you get on our website, you can find out what programs and activities are going on right now. So uh, you can also find out how to get the uh, information through your uh, computer or your phone if you just follow the uh, information right there up on the, on the board. Uh, so I think that's it for the announcements. I have one more announcement. Tomorrow, this gentleman right here has a birthday. I didn't ask which one, only because I don't want anybody asking me. But he is older than me, I will tell you that much. Um, so, Lorianne, are you ready? Please join me. You all must be triskaidekaphobics because it's uh, that's a fear of 13. You're celebrating my birthday on the 12th, but that's okay. Thank you. That was very kind. I appreciate it. I was born in 1950. You can do the math. Okay. Well, we'll have you bring forward the social justice lantern, just because it's his birthday. He still has to do the work. We light this lantern from our community chalice. 
it's, it's a small gesture that symbolizes all the light and warmth that each of you take out into the community and share with others. This morning, we opened our hearts and minds to new ideas. We pondered the meaning of the wonders around us, questioned our leaders, and sought new ways of looking at life. Now we've come to the end of our time together, and we must extinguish our chalices. May we remain as kindred spirits until we meet again. Our closing hymn is number 142 in the gray hymnal. It's in the number 142. Please rise in body and spirit. comfortable join hands with those around you as we say our closing words do we have closing words <laughs> thank you may faith in the spirit of life hope for the community of earth and love for the sacred in one another be ours now and in all the days to come.